Adams State College. Great stories begin here. Sir, you have a few good talks left in April. In this week, we have um, a visiting speaker who is actually the uncle of a couple of our chemistry students, but he will be speaking about nuclear weapons testing in the 1950s, so that should be a, a pretty good experience. He's a retired director at some level of uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories, or uh, some some portion therein. So, uh, and we all we also have, I think. Even we have a student presentation from the uh, sustainability chemistry course in uh, about mid to late uh, April. We have another visiting speaker from UCCS. Um, we'll be talking about science and whether the U.S. is competitive. And then Dr. Weathers will also be giving a presentation in early May. So we still have lots of good talks left this semester. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Vance today, who will be speaking about uh, sphere packing and kissing in a variety of dimensions. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Matt. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming today. Let me hit some of the lights here. Well, let's see if we can. All right. Is that dark enough? Is there one? That's is there one? one, that's one, that's one. No. There you go. All right. Thank you. All right. So as Matt said, is I'm going to be talking about two problems today. So I'm going to be talking about sphere packing, which is a famous problem, which is um, almost four centuries old, which has been recently solved. And then I'm going to talk about kissing, which I got, I, I talked to my 106 students, and they were very excited when I talked to them about, I'm going to teach you how to kiss in different dimensions. So we're going to talk about kissing at the end. Okay. And I'm getting used to this, so I apologize if I run through a little quickly. Okay, so here's just a quick outline of what we're going to be doing is what I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with just kind of the history of the problem, is how it got started. Okay, and it got, it got started with, um, it's called Kepler's Conjecture, and it just basically started with stacking cannonballs. And then once we talk about this problem, it's basically this is a three-dimensional version, we're going to be the classical mathematician and say, can we generalize this? Can we look at kissing or look at sphere packing in higher dimensions? And so that's what we're going to be looking at next. And so in order to talk about higher dimensions, I need to first of all tell you, what is, a, say, a 10-dimensional sphere? What do we mean by that? So we need to kind of formalize what do we, how do we work in 10 dimensions. Okay. And then once we do that, we're going to talk about, well, why should you care? Which you, you should. You should care why you want to pack maybe a 10-dimensional sphere. And then on the last parts, we're going to talk about kissing, which is going to be, we're going to start out with the kissing number problem. And then we're going to look at it from a couple different angles, just so we don't have to look at just maybe ordinary kissing. We can look at it at different, different ways of kissing. So, all right, so this is where we're headed. So to start out, let me, is we're going to start out with the story of sphere packing. Okay. It starts out in 1590. Okay. So we have Sir Walter Raleigh. He's a ship captain. He has cannonballs on his ships, and he wants to pack them efficiently. And then also, on the same token, is if he has a bunch of cannonballs and he wants to pack them on his ship, he wants to figure out, well, how much space do I really need for these cannonballs? Okay, so he was curious on, you know, how do we stack these cannonballs efficiently? Well, lucky for him, he had a mathematician to talk to. So he had a mathematician named Thomas Harriet. He was an English astronomer as well as a mathematician. And he asked him, you know, can you solve this problem? So. For Harriet, he looked at, he looked at basically if, if I have a stack, say, this high, how many cannonballs are going to be in the stack? And he looked at things like if you have so many cannonballs, how much room does he need on a ship and how should he be stacking them? And they're going to be always stacking them in these types of configurations. Now, they can change the base up. They don't always need to have a square base. When I talk about the base, I'm talking about, is there, oh, there's not a pointer on here. Okay. There we go. So there's not a point around here. So what we have is on the base up here is the very bottom layer of balls where they're sitting at. That's where the base is at. And so I don't ne necessarily need to start out with a square base, is maybe I can start out with a rectangular base or a triangular base, or we could get a little more creative than that. So he actually went a little bit further and said, well, if you had a square base of such size or a rectangular base of such size, how many balls can you stack? Okay, so he went nuts with cannonballs. All right, so this was a neat problem for him to work with, and it was a useful problem because he was helping out Sir Walter Raleigh on, you know, stacking his cannonballs. Well, he also had other interests, too. Around this time, as he was promoting what's called atomic theory. And so this is the idea that everything in nature is composed of atoms. 
Okay, so if you think of a whole bunch of atoms packing together and stacking cannonballs, there should be some relationships. So, while he was looking at his atomic theory, is here walks in Kepler. So he actually, Kepler at the same time was studying optics, and Kepler was not a believer of atomic theory. And so what Rowlett, or what Harriet did, is Harriet wrote a letter to Kepler, so I believe it was right around 1606, 1607, is he wrote a letter to Kepler asking him or urging him that he should adopt this theory. Now one of his justifications is if you look at the way water, uh, light, when it, goes, it, when it hits water is it's partially reflected and then partially goes through the water. And so this was one of his reasonings on why Kepler should adopt this atomic theory in his study of optics. Well, Kepler wasn't very receptive. And he, you know, happily declined and he said, you know, I'm not really interested in this. Well, it turns out Kepler may have had a change of heart, at least slightly. And what happened is he wrote a paper and basically he was talking about snowflakes. And he referred to them as packing these tiny pellets together in a very tight configuration. Okay. And then later in the same pa paper, he talked about packing of tiny pellets, tiny spherical pellets, and talking about these tiny pellets in a super large container. And he was talking about, well, what is the tightest configuration that we can, we can receive? Equivalently is saying, how many pellets can we pack in a container? Okay, so if you guys remember when you're a kid and you see like a, a jar of gumballs and like they'll say like count how many gumballs are in the jar, well this is kind of like that problem, is you want to just figure out how many, how many gumballs are going to be in the jar. Okay, well this turned out to be called Kepler's conjecture. This is something that he took for granted and he just assumed, it, well he just, you know, kind of like clearly it's true. We know it's true. You can see this if you go into the grocery store. If you look at, say, look at a stack of oranges in the grocery store. It's probably not a mathematician that stacked those, but whoever stacked those knows that they're stacking their oranges very well. They're stacking them in these types of configurations. And if you tell them otherwise that it's not good, well, they're going to tell you, you're, you're foolish, you're silly. So he just kind of put, he just said this, but didn't actually prove it and give a, a mathematical proof, this rigorous proof. But it ended up, ended up being a big open problem later on, even though Kepler, you know, he just said, this is it. He didn't feel the need to give a proof. Well, being mathematicians, we want to give a proof. Okay. Well, it turns out that well, we, we, we need to be able to formalize this problem and say, well, what do we need, mean about a large container? How do I pack in a large container, and how big does it need to be? Okay. So this is where we're going to get, in, get into the idea. Well, let's just say it's infinitely big. Okay. So suppose we have an infinitely big container. We have a bunch of, let's just say we have a bunch of cannonballs, and we want to stack these cannonballs into this container so that it's going to fill the greatest proportion of space. Notice the volume it's going to occupy, since it's infinitely big, the volume's going to be infinite. So I can't actually compute the volume because it's just going to be infinity. But I can look at the proportion of space that's occupied by the spheres. And so that's the quantity that we're going to look at maximizing. Okay. So if we're going to do this, let's first talk about how, to, how do we go about doing this. Because that all sounds nice as I have a bunch of balls, I pack them into space. Well, how do I do that? Okay. One of the ways that we can do this is we can start with, we can start with just basically one layer of balls. So as you see above, we have some oranges. So we can start with one layer of oranges. And what happens is, if you see the oranges, there's some holes in them. So if you look at between basically every set of four oranges, there's a big hole between them. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take now another layer, and we're going to stagger them so it's going to stack on top of this layer, but it's going to make it as tight as possible. And so we're going to work that way so it's going to fit together just nice like a jigsaw puzzle. And then we're going to, so now we'll have two layers, and we're going to repeat this process and keep repeating this process. And eventually we'll get basically a stacking of spheres in our entire space. Okay. So this is the idea of where we start with a two-dimensional stacking, and then we're going to make it basically keep stacking it to get three dimensions. All right. So that's one way to do it. That's kind of a nice, you know, pretty way, because we can start with something that we can see. Another way to do it is just, let's just take a bunch of points. Okay. You can think of basically three-dimensional space. We can classify each point in three-dimensional space by a set of coordinates. And so I can take a collection of coordinates 
And I can choose them so that each coordinate is going to be sufficiently far apart from each other, and I'm going to place a, spe a sphere on each of these coordinates. Okay. And so what I need to do is make sure all of the coordinates are sufficient, have a sufficient distance away from each other so that I can choose my radii of the, my sphere so that I can pack a sphere on each of these points. Okay. Now this sounds nice in theory, but how do I write down an infinite number of points? So we might have to use some regularity conditions or something a little nicer to work with than just arbitrary points. Okay. And so just one last thing, just to emphasize again, the density when I talk about these things is the proportion of space covered by the spheres, not the actual area. Okay, Because again, the area is going to be infinite. All right, so we've got this Kepler conjecture. So this started in 1609, and then this the whole idea of sphere packing even started earlier. Let's talk a little bit about the history. Okay. Well, 1609, that's a long time ago. So we start out with this conjecture. Gets a little attention, but people had worked on it. But it was one of those, things, those problems that physicists thought this, well, this is obvious. Why bother to prove this? No one was able to prove this. Well, little progress first came about, well, over two centuries later. Okay, so two centuries went by, no progress. The simple, this simple problem was basically, how do you stack oranges the best? Okay, not too hard. But it turned out that 200 years later, Gauss was able to prove a partial result. He wasn't able to prove Kepler's conjecture, but he said if we require that basically our sphere centers follow a grid. Okay, so they have this regular pattern, kind of the pattern that you saw in oranges, is um, basically if they, if they have a grid, meaning that they can't just be arranged like all this disorder, that if they follow a grid, that basically the, the packing that Kepler said was going to be optimal, that is indeed optimal. Well, for the poor guy that whose book he was reviewing, the review was actually more important than the book itself. So I have to mention, I had to look up his name. His name was Siever. So he wrote a book on what's called quadratic forms. It's a kind of like a basically high-level linear algebra. And so he wrote a book on quadratic forms. Gauss was nice enough to write a review for his book. Well, Gauss proved a major result in his book review. So that's how it happens. All right, so that was in 1831. Well, once Gauss proved this, this was a major result, but it still didn't prove the problem. Later in 19, 1901, well, it was actually when, when it was published, but it was in 1900, a famous mathematician named Hilbert, to the International Congress of Mathematicians, they met in Paris right at 1900. They had a conference there, and Hilbert, he had a list of 23 problems we, he thought should guide mathematics for the next century. This was on them. Other problems that were on here were like the Riemann hypothesis. This is one of these problems where if you solve it, you get a million dollars. Well, it's a really hard problem to solve, but if you solve it, you still get a million dollars. But this was, this was a very important problem that Hilbert thought was very important. Okay? So this was in 1901. He just, you know, he, he wanted to shine a little more light on this problem. Well, over 50 years later, still no solution, but we're getting towards it. We're, we're starting to approach something. And a, a guy named Laszlo Fayez Toth is he reduced the problem to just instead of this huge maximization problem, you're maximizing the density, to he made it a maximization problem of finitely many variables. So now we have a maximization problem of finitely many variables. Sounds like maybe we can attack this with calculus. Okay? You guys have done maximization problems in calculus. And even if you don't know calculus, you can, if you have a parabola, like a quadratic function, you know how to find the maximum value by finding its vertex. So we have some tools to work with. Unfortunately, we had about 150 variables or so. So that's a huge maximization problem. So the techniques that you learn in calculus don't quite work for here. Okay. But at least this is a hope. Now, one of the things that was neat is even in 53, Faye's Toth, he thought, like, well, maybe someday a computer can solve this. Okay. So computers can do amazing things, much more amazing than we can do. So he thought, well, maybe this is open to computers. Okay. Well, 1990. A poor fellow, he announced that he had a solution. Unfortunately, polls were poked in it. Okay, so this was in 1990. He actually published this. Well, he didn't publish it in a journal, which is where most ma mathematics is published. He published it in a book because journals would not take it. So there is a proof out there, which is 
has mathematicians don't believe, but it's in a book somewhere. So be wary when you read things in books sometimes. So they're not always true. But, so that was in 1990. Finally, along comes Thomas Hales. He's a mathematician at the University of Michigan. And he had worked on this problem for six solid years. And what ended up happening is he used a huge computer to solve this problem, where he reduced this to, as I said, 150 variables. And what he ended up proving is he used these massive computer calculations to rule out implausible sphere packings. Okay? And he proved it. it it's, even though this sounds like a simple proof, you just use a computer, two, over 250 pages of proof. I can't even imagine writing 200 pages of math, let alone proving this in 250 pages. Okay, so that was just for the proof. Well, once his proof was accepted, the mathematics community was excited. Because he, what he did is when he, he, he proved it, he just threw everything up on the internet. He said, come and look. Come and inspect this. Uh, you know, come and look. He threw up his code. You can find his code on his website, and you go, can go through his computer code and go through all his calculations. And people went through, and it's like a massive amount, and you can't actually check everything by hand. But people were convinced. Okay. Well, the problem is, is we have these mathematicians. We're we're kind of we're kind of anal sometimes. We're very rigorous. Okay. So he had submitted this to the Journal of Annals of Mathematics very prestigious mathematics journal. Okay. The top mathematicians published in this journal. Okay. They had accepted this, but they weren't really feeling very good about it because they don't like computers. Mathematicians and computer scientists, there's a little overlap, but sometimes we don't like each other too much. Okay. So what they were going to do is they thought, well, we will publish it, but we're going to put a disclaimer. We're going to say, we have checked this, but not completely. Well, that's not good enough, because that says really that, well, we, we looked at part of it. We're not fully convinced, but we'll publish it anyways. So that didn't work out. So what happened is there was a nice compromise. Is Hales ended up splitting his work into two parts, where all the, mat the rigorous proofs that you see, like when you start from theorem, you know, write a bunch of ac you know, start with some axioms, and then you write a bunch of logical arguments, and then, then there's your proof. So he put that part in the annals, and then another journal, the Journal of Discrete and Computational Geometry, contains the bulk of his work. And so this is where all of his other work appears. And he, it was a series of six papers that he had published in there. And one was published under the name of one of his graduate students that worked on it. So they split it up. And this was kind of like the happy medium where they found it. Okay. All right, so now it's 400 years later. This is something that grocers knew the whole time. But well, we needed a huge computer and over 250 pages to actually solve this. All right, well, you're kind of wondering, like, well, why is this so hard? We're just packing a bunch of oranges. This shouldn't be that hard. You don't, if you go apply at the grocery store, you don't need a math degree. They might kind of laugh at you, be like, you want to use math? But, well, it turns out that this is pretty hard because, first of all, sphere packings, if we don't have it on, like, a regular grid, is computing the density of a, an infinite number of spheres in an infinitely large box, well, sometimes we can't actually even do this. This is a really hard problem. Another problem is what there's call, what's called what's many local maxima. So for those calculus students here, is if you think of when, you're when you have a function and you can figure out where the derivative is equal to zero or undefined, this is where, we're, um, where we have a critical point, and then if you have a local ma maxima, meaning, meaning that if you're just in the neighborhood, that basically your function might be this huge wavy thing, but if you're in a neighborhood where it, you're at a peak, this is what's called a local maxima. Well, it turns out in this function of 150 variables, there's a lot of little, like, mini peaks. So if you try to find these peaks using the method of calculus, well, there's just so many peaks, well, you're going to exhaust yourself trying to find these, and you're not going to find them all. Okay. Other issues are this trying to, it's hard to figure out, um, rule out implausible sphere configurations. One of the problems that we're going to see in just a few minutes is, one of the central questions was, if I have one sphere, and I want to put other spheres around it, so that they're all going to be tangent to it, so they're going to touch it, how many spheres can I do that? Okay. Well, it turns out this was actually a really hard question, too. 
even though if you probably give a toddler some balls and like they probably could figure out it out for you but not not with our rigorous mathematical proof but they could they might be even able to tell you be able to tell you the answer so this was some um, some of the issues that we had here sorry getting ahead of myself there we go and then the last thing is even though Kepler gave you one packing there's infinitely many other packings that can be obtained in the exact um, same, same manner that Kepler got, but they're geometrically, they're different. Okay? So Kepler's solution is not unique. Okay? So these are some of the issues that were faced. All right, so that's sphere packing dimension three. This was a huge problem. Now, I'm a mathematician, and what I'm going to say is, can we generalize this? And I'm going nuts with this thing, sorry about that. Is, can we generalize this? Okay? We solved dimension three. Let's do some more. Okay. I finally feel like I have. A, I understand the problem. Let's see if we can look at this in other dimensions. Okay. And this is kind of like this is why we have jobs is we know how to generalize things and try to get more mileage out of problems. So we want to look at this in other dimensions than just three. Okay. Well, in order to do this, we need to figure out well what is a sphere in other dimensions? What is the same? What is the notion of sphere? Well, in dimension two, what should we think of as a sphere? Yeah, it should be a circle. Okay. Now, higher dimensions. So, I like your dimension two. We're going to think about th this as a circle or a disk. In higher dimensions, how would we define what a sphere means? Right? Three dimensions, we have a ball. Now, once we get in higher dimensions, we need, first of all, the notion of a distance. Okay? Because if you can define a distance, if you guys learned, when you learn your formula for a circle, is you, a lot of times you learn it using the distance formula. Is the idea is you take a center, and then you take all points that are within a certain distance from that center, and then you draw your circle. Okay. Well, we can do the same thing for a sphere. Okay, a sphere in three dimensions is you take a center, and then you take all points within a certain distance from that center, and then let's fill it in and make it into a, a solid sphere. Well, we can do the same thing in higher dimensions. Okay? But first of all, we need a notion of distance. Okay? So, oh, sorry about that. All right, so let's we'll start up uh, with distances. Okay? So when I talk about Rn, that little funny R symbol, that just means the real numbers. Okay? So the numbers that you know and love. So this is positive, negative, zero. So if I talk about a point in Rn, is this is just an ordered set of real numbers. Okay, and so I'm going to use this notation here. Now this is the same notation you use in the Cartesian plane. So when you have x and y, I'm just going to rewrite those as x1 and y2, or sorry, x1 and x2. And so we can, now we're going to define a distance, but it's going to be based off of our distance that we know and basically in just the real numbers. Where if you define the distance between two points, is you just take the absolute value between their difference. And then this should look like the distance formula and uh, this should look like the distance formula that you see in your college algebra class. Now we can generalize this. Okay. So what we can do is, now we're going to take two points in Rn, and basically we're just, if I were just to cut off this part as I get my distance formula, and now, but I'm just going to keep going. Because now I'm just going to take the squared difference between each of the coordinates. Okay. And so this works in dimension 3, dimension 4, dimension 16, as large as you want. Okay. And so just below, I have just a quick example of how I would compute the distance between these two points and R4. So they're on R4 because each of them has four. These, each of these numbers are called coordinates. So the first coordinate's one, the second coordinate's two, the third coordinate's four, and so on. So what I do is I compute the distance between these two points. And use putting these into the formula, I say, well, these two points are approximately three and a half units apart. So we have a notion of distance. All right. Well, now that we have distance, now we can define a sphere. So in, a, in the same way that we did in three dimensions and two dimensions, is we define a sphere. So basically, we have a center. I'm going to be calling the center x. And then what I do is I take all points that are within a certain distance. And I'm call, going to call that distance r, just to represent the radius that you're used to for a circle. Okay. And so the boundary of the sphere is going to be basically the points that there are, it, there's distances that exactly equal r. So for example, the boundary of a disk, well, it's just going to be the circle that we talked about here. 
Now in one dimension, our notion of a sphere, well, it's just a unit interval. And then the boundary is just going to be the endpoint. Okay? Now, if I wish I could draw you a four-dimensional sphere, I can't. I can't draw in four dimensions. But we can generalize this notion of four dimensions. So for pictures, we'll just work with probably two and three dimensions, just to keep it simple. Okay? All right. So now that we have spheres, let's talk about packing them. Okay? So the sphere packing problem now becomes, how do we take these spheres, so they're all going to be identical, and how do we pack them now, instead of into just our normal space that we live in every day, is how do we pack them into an n-dimensional space? Okay. So, for example, if I have a four-dimensional sphere, how do I pack four-dimensional spheres into four-dimensional space? Okay. Well, you're probably like, oh, why is she working in a four-dimensional space? Okay. Well, it turns out there are some really neat applications of sphere packings and some reasons why you should care. Okay. So just a few reasons is, for example, in three, three, um, three dimensions, it's, it's a nice geometric question. We have a bunch of objects. We want to put them in the space as tightly as possible. How do we do this? Okay. Just as a mathematician, I think it's beautiful. But that might not be enough for you guys. So let's go a little further. Okay. Stacking produce is fun, but what are other things that we can stack? There's a lot of spherical objects. Suppose you make ball bearings, and you want to ship ball bearings efficiently. Well, you probably should put it in a nice sphere packing in three dimensions. Now, another thing is what I've seen is, what I wish I had a picture of this, is if you have a bunch of cylindrical objects, so you have a, a bunch of cylindrical objects as you look down on them, basically they just look like a bunch of circles. Okay. So if you're looking down on a bunch of cylinders and you're looking down a bunch of circles, is you want to know, well, how can I p pack these disks in as tightly as possible? Okay. Now the picture I'm thinking of is I've seen a picture of basically you have a bunch of kegs. And so you want to put them in as tightly as possible because if you want to, basically you want to minimize the amount of volume that they occupy. And so essentially this is the circle packing. Okay. Now, that's kind of neat in itself. It's, uh, it's OK. You know, I'd not be very excited. But where it does get exciting, in my opinion, is where it starts when we talk about what's called error correcting codes. Okay? Error correcting codes are just sequences of zeros and ones. They can be more general than this. But I'll talk about binary ones. These are just basically code words that are sequences of zeros and ones where they're going to have a certain length. So let's say they have um, length 10. And so there's just a bunch of um, zeros and ones, and each different sequence represents a code word. Okay. So the idea of an error correcting code is, let's choose our code words so that they're different enough. So if I send you a code word and you receive it, that if one of the ones actually gets flipped, accidentally gets flipped to a zero, or a zero gets flipped to a one, that, well, you can detect that, and then you can not only detect that and correct that. And so that's the idea is we're going to basically make these different enough so that if I receive a code word and I'm, I look at my code word list and say, well, this isn't one of my code words, I can say, oh, well, it looks mostly like this code word. And so that's the code word that I say, oh, you probably meant to send me this instead. Okay. So this is a continuous analog of this. All right. Now, in actual communications, how this works is that or one of the ways you can see this is we can choose a bunch of signals. Now, what I mean by a signal is, in this case, my code word is now going to be a point in Rn. It's no longer restricted to zeros and ones. It can take on any real value. Each coordinate can take on any real value. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose these points in Rn. Now, I'm going to choose them so that they're distance from the origin. I represent the origin by the big zero. So that their distance from the origin is going to um, be bounded above by some number. How you can interpret this is this is the amount of power it takes to send a signal. And so we, don't, we, don't, we, we have only a finite amount of power to send a signal across a noisy channel. And so this is where this upper bound is coming in. Now the idea with these signals is basically I'm just, I can send a signal. Now if I want to send you a message, is I'm just going to send you several signals. You can think of these basically as words. Okay? So I keep sending you words. And you're going to be receiving these words. Well, the problem is if we're in a noisy channel, or you can even think of it if you're in a noisy room, is you might not hear me correctly. But you're going to make your best approximation of what you thought I said. So even above all of the noise in the room, you're going to say, well, I think she said this. 
okay, based on whatever information or whatever words I'm using. Okay. Well, the idea of this is, so here's kind of a picture of what's going on before I get ahead of myself. So we start out as we have a transmitter. So in this case, it's me. I'm sending you a signal. It's going across the room, so it's going across this noisy channel. And then you receive the signal. It, there's a good chance it's going to be different than what I originally sent, but it should be fairly close to it. Okay. And so you're going to take the signal, and then you're going to try to figure out, well, what did I mean to say? All right, well, the idea of this is you want to be able to detect exactly what I said. You don't want to try to approximate it. This is bad things could happen this way. If I tell you something across the room and you misinterpret it, okay, we could get in an argument. You might think I, I called you a bad name. I don't know. Okay. Well, th so we want to know how to communicate without error. So here's the idea. Is what we're going to do is we're going to choose our signals so that they're going to be far apart. So that how, what's going to happen is that they're spread far enough apart so that I know that my signal is not going to be perturbed that much or not going to be changed that much from the extra noise in the room. And so you can detect what I meant to set. So the way to see this is I have these signal senses. You can think of our code words or our words that we're just talking as points. And then I'm going to take them far enough apart so I know that even with, with, with the particular noise level in the room, is that it's gonna, whatever I send you is going to land somewhere in this desk. If I meant to t send you this signal, well, it's going to land somewhere in here. And so if you, get, if you receive a signal that lands somewhere in here, you're going to say, well, she meant to send me this. Okay? So that's the idea of basically we have these signals. We can put a ball around each of them. So if you receive a signal inside that, or receive a message in, or a signal inside that, that you know what I meant to tell you. Okay. So that's the idea of spreading apart. Because notice if we put them over, if we have the signals overlap, well then if you receive something in here, you don't know what I meant to tell you. So this is the idea basically, we're sphere packing. Okay. Notice that each of our signals has a ball. In this case it's it's a two-dimensional ball, but we can do this in the higher dimensions. So each of these signals has a ball around it. And the radius is going to be determined by the noise level on basically how far, far the original signal can be different than the signal that you actually receive over there. So we're going to have a ball around this. And basically, we're sphere packing. Okay. All right. So we're sphere packing, but we want to do it well. Because the problem is, is, if we have a bunch of these signals spread apart, well, that's good and dandy. But we want a lot of words. Because the more words we have, the faster we can communicate. The better we can communicate. We don't have to keep repeating ourselves. So basically, we want to pack as many of these balls inside of this huge ball that has this radius of what's determined by the power that we have. Okay. Now, once this power gets bigger and bigger, or these balls inside get smaller and smaller, this is the same sphere packing problem. Okay. So we're trying to pack these balls in as tightly as possible. And this actually has real world applications. And this is an active area of research in what's called information theory. All right, so I hope you're convinced that sphere packing is important. Okay. Now, now that I've pretty much told you sphere packing is important, let's talk about what's known. Okay. Dimension one. If I want to pack a bunch of intervals in a one dimensional space, how do I do this? Well, it turns out what I do is I just take one interval, I take another interval, put them right next to each other. I'm going to take another interval, just put them right next to each other, and we can keep doing this forever. Not too exciting. So what happens is we can basically just get intervals after intervals and land next to each other. So basically I cover the entire space. So if I cover the entire space, what proportion of space is going to be covered? 100%, yes, so one. All right, you guys got to know your percent. So it's 100% of space is going to be covered. All right, so that's dimension one. Well, in dimension two, it turns out that this is a nice hexagonal packing that you see here, that this is going to be optimal for, for two dimensions. Okay. And this was actually, this was conjectured. Um, this was conjectured to be optimal um, after the, soon after Kepler's conjecture, but it went like the Kepler conjecture, this wasn't actually rigorously proven until 1943. Okay. 
Now, this last one, this is the sphere packing that we talked about earlier. One thing that is kind of cool about this is if you look on just one side of this packing, so maybe tilt your head to the left and look at this side of the sphere packing. Do you notice anything unusual about that or kind of unique about it? Now look at that and then look directly above. Does that look similar at all? Okay. This is our idea of stack of basically we take the best two-dimensional packing, so kind of when we were talking about stacking oranges earlier, is we stack a layer of oranges using this optimal two-dimensional packing. And then what we do is we just keep stacking them one by one on top of each other. So that's one way we can actually obtain the best three-dimensional packing from the best two-dimensional packing. Well, this might lead you to a conjecture. Well, can we maybe use this idea to get the best four-dimensional packing? And then if we go on, can we use the best four-dimensional packing to get the best five-dimensional packing? And I can go on for a while, but I'll stop here. It turns out the answer is no. This is one of these patterns that you see that even if I restrict a, um, the, rig the packings where basically the, the spheres are put on a grid, is the answer is yes up until dimension eight. But dimension nine, something goes wrong. Now, I don't live in dimension nine, so I don't know much about dimension nine, but that's one of the kind of the myster mysteries of sphere packings, is you start to see this pattern that looks really cool, and you know, let's see if we can just stack these things. Well, it turns out that by dimension nine, it doesn't work, okay? All right, greater than four, for dimensions greater than four, this is an open problem, okay? All right, now, having the three-dimensional problem just solved in 1998, I'm not too hopeful. Although surprisingly in dimension 24, they're actually cl very close to proving that a particular sphere packing is optimal in dimension 24. Well, they're actually, they get, the problem is they're using computers. And again, mathematicians were not so cool with those computer guys, is that they're using computers, but they're getting within, say, 24 decimal digits of that basically what they're doing is they're proving an, an upper bound that was in within 24 decimal digits of what a sphere packing that they know, okay? So here's your answer, here's their upper bound says, well, the optimal sphere packing can't be bigger than this, and the difference is they're the same up to 24 decimal digits. Well, to me that sounds good enough, but to the mathematical community, unfortunately, that's not good enough. Okay, so they're still working. But it's one of those mysteries is why do we know more about 24 dimensions than dimension four? So, I don't know. All right, so we have the sphere packing problem. It's kind of important. And we don't know much about it. We only know the solution up to dimension three. Well, how do we look at this problem in higher dimensions? First of all, first of all, we don't live in dimension four, so it's hard to study sphere packing in dimension four. So how do we do it? Well, there's a couple different approaches. I might move through these kind of quickly so I have enough time for kissing, because I'm running out of time. So two of the ways we do this is we use these lattices. So basically we take these grids, and so if we study the grids, maybe we can study the sphere packing problem. The other way is to look at upper bounds and lower bounds. So if, say like, well, the density is no bigger than this, or it's no smaller than this, and then hopefully that maybe that we'll just get them closer and closer together, and then boom, we'll have, find the sphere packing density. Okay. Well, these are just a couple of the ways. Kind of in my research, I work on upper bounds. I'm gonna quickly go through slides, and sorry, so just close your eyes. I'm gonna skip these slides here. So we're gonna go through the up, for, so for example, of an upper bound, is this is what kind of the area that I work in, is just an idea of a simple one is we can start with a bunch of spheres. Take a bunch of spheres in space. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add more spheres to it. And we're gonna keep adding spheres and keep adding spheres until there's no more room to add a sphere, okay? So we have these sphere packings that they're what called saturated, meaning I can't add any more spheres. Well, with this saturated sphere packing, what I can do now is I can double the radius of all my spheres and then if I double the radius, keeping the centers the same, what I end up getting is every point in my space is gonna be covered. It's a covering of my entire space, okay? So that tells me that my sphere packing, since if I double the, double the, double the radius, that my sphere packing, well, it had to ha cover at least one over to the n 
um, por nth, I can't say that right, portion of space. Now that n is coming in because we're in n dimensions, okay? Because notice that when you're working with volume, when you scale, so for example, if you scale a sphere by, say, 2, well, you're actually scaling the volume by 2 to the third. And so that's where the n is coming in. So this is just a way of getting a, this lower bound of 1 to the 2n. Well, turns out that, that or sorry, this, an upper bound of 1 to the 2n. Turns out that this is really, the bounds out there aren't much better than this. So here's just a quick list of what the bounds are. Now there's some mathematical symbols. If you don't know what they are, don't worry about it. Um, that these are some of the bounds. That zeta of n, the little curly thing, that's when n gets big, it's right about 1. So that's just ignore that, act like it's not even there. So these are the bounds that we have. Notice that they all have this 2 to the n factor. Except for now, they start to get, and there should be an n up here. I forgot that. Um, they have an n up top. And it turns out these are the best there are. Now, the lower bounds differ dramatically, so it's unfortunate. So these certainly don't prove the sphere packing problem. But these, are the, these do give you some upper bounds to start with. Okay, so this is just one approach. All right. Okay, so we're done with sphere packing. Let's talk about kissing. So we want to finish off with kissing here. So this is what's called the kissing number problem. And this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier when I talked about implausible configurations in sphere packing. So the kissing number problem says, how many spheres can kiss a single sphere at once? Now this terminology, kiss, it actually comes from billiards. So if you basically, if you hit a ball and it touches another ball, it kisses it. Okay? And so we want to know how many balls can we kiss? All right, well, in dimension three, works kind of interesting is this was called the 13 spheres problem. And again, it's, it originated with billiard balls. Well, it turns out two guys, one guy named Newton, one guy named Gregory, that they had an argument over this problem. Newton said, there's 12 balls that can kiss and no more. Gregory said, nope, I think we can put an extra ball in there. Okay, so they actually, these, these are pretty big guys, kind of important. You might see their names in some of your mathematical texts. They were arguing about this, and it turns out that in their, li in their lifetime, neither knew who was right. That's okay. That's how arguments go sometimes. But Newton was actually correct. And so he was proved correct in 1874 by a man named Two. Well, it turns out this wasn't this rigorous mathematical proof. So if for mathematicians, we'll say he was proven correct in 19, um, 1953, although the main ideas, the arguments, were there in 1874. Okay. So Newton was correct. Well, here's two famous scientists, and they don't even know how many balls to place around a sphere. So this might be an interesting problem to look at in other dimensions, too. So we can look at it in other dimensions. Well, in dimension one, this isn't very exciting. The kissing number is just two. Because what this is asking is, how many spheres? Well, in this case, it's just an interval. How many intervals can I place around an interval? So we have our interval. It says, how many intervals can touch it? Well, I can put one over here, and I can put one over here. Since we're lying in one dimensional space, I can't put one up here, because we're still in one dimensional space. So our kissing number is two. Um, and then once you get to dimension two, our kissing number jumps up to six, and then you see the other kissing numbers up here. I won't read them for you. But again, this mysterious dimension 24, and even eight, we know the kissing, dimension in 20, kissing number in 24, but we don't know the kissing number in dimension five. I don't know, but it's kind of curious on why that happens. Okay. All right, so let's talk, kind of analyze this kissing. Well, the kissing number's been solved in dimension three. But maybe we can use some of the ideas in dimension three to look at other dimensions. Okay. So there's a couple of ways that we can view kissing. Now we could view kissing just as basically you have a bunch of balls, you want to put them together. Okay, we can do that. But let's try to use a little geometry here. So if we look at these spheres kissing, as you can notice that all of these lengths are equal. Because since all of these spheres are the same, is this length has to equal this length, has to equal this length. So what's the angle of this then going to be? I hear a couple whispers of it. It's going to be 60 degrees, right? Because it's going to be an equilateral triangle. Well, so that's in two dimensions. Now if I do the same thing in three dimensions, 
and I look at the angles between the sphere centers, we still have 60 degrees. Well, I can't draw a four-dimensional picture again, but if we look at this in four dimensions, we still have a 60 degree angle and we can keep going on forever. Okay, so we can look at this as basically we need to have the spheres touch so that the, ang so that the angle between their centers is going to be at least 60 degrees. Because if it's smaller, what that tells us is that basically the spheres, their interiors, they're going to have to be smooshed together. Okay, so they're no longer going to be our nice identical smears, spheres. Okay. All right, the second idea is let's look at these points. Okay, maybe we don't have to look at spheres on it. Maybe we can just look at these points. Because again, we still have this nice angle here. But if I double the radius of my sphere, so suppose this was one foot, now we have a radius of two feet, is I look at all of my points, the centers are going to lie on this larger sphere that has radius two feet. Now this one, you can't really see it too well because there's a red center and then there's a larger sphere that all the centers are going on. But trust me, it's there. So let's see if we can combine these two. Well, combining these two is now we have these angles and then we have these points on a sphere. So the question now asks you is, how can you place points on a sphere so that the angle between every pair of points is going to be at least 60 degrees? Okay, so now we can, instead of drawing a bunch of spheres, we can just look at points. Okay. All right, last way we're going to look at cake kissing is what's called a spherical cap. Is if you notice the sphere is I draw a cone originating from the center and I look at the shadow of the sphere on here. It turns out that that shadow forms what's called a spherical cap. And since I can do that for every sphere, the same way it's asking is how, how many spherical caps can I place on the sphere so that they're not going to be overlapping. Well, this is kind of like our sphere packing problem again, except for now we're working on a sphere instead of this big space. Okay. All right, final problem, I promise, is basically we have to start with a bunch of points. Let's just make the distance between every pair of point maximum. Now, do we know an object that behaves like this? I'm thinking like maybe electrons, anything that's repulsed from each other. Now this is just a model, I'm, there's quantum mechanics to deal with things like that. But this is just a model where we have two things that are repulsed by each other, so they want to get as far apart. So if I have say 10 points, they want to get as far apart from their neighbors as possible. Okay? So this is the idea, is we have these points and we want to figure out how far apart can they get. Well, we can equivalently we can look at the angle and we can say how big of an angle can they make. And if it's 60 degrees, well, we're back to our kissing number problem. So this is just a more general version of our kissing number problem. All right, so just a quick last slide is this is kind of what I do in this research. And so um, I'm hoping to do some projects with some of the mathematics majors is particularly I want to look at binary error correcting codes. For you computer scientists out there, please strongly consider this as a project. And so the idea is there's some relationship between kissing configuration, codes, and lattices, and sphere packings. And so I would love to explore these with an undergraduate. And last thing is, here's some references. Really look at the top three. Number two, the reason I put those up is that's Thomas's Hill's website. It has a lot of stuff. It's intended for undergraduates. It's very accessible. You can read about this problem. It has a history. And then number two and number three are in your library. And these are books for undergraduates, which you can read about sphere packings and kissing notes. All right, so thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for any other <laughs> Yes? So on the two-dimensional case, the configuration is the same for both the optimum packing as well as the kissing number configuration. Is that correct? Um, yes. So, so you have six surrounding the one. It's the same true in the higher dimensions as well? So uh, when, when you have the whatever the one that's called, the optimal packing uh, with Kepler's conjecture. Right. What is, what is the number of spheres that are touching there? It turns out it's 12, and let me get, I th thought I showed a slide with this. I didn't. Okay. Well, it turns out that this is actually a loose packing. I actually, no, th no, this is Kepler's conjecture. It's rotate a little bit. So if you notice in his packing that all of the spheres are touching each other. Now, what happened with Newton and Gregory is, 
Uh, what happens is this is a completely different configuration where these spheres are not actually touching each other. And so what happens is you can take what's called the icosahedron and you can center a sphere on each point and you can obtain a sphere packing. And so these spheres aren't touching each other and so that led them to label maybe I could fit a 13th sphere. But that one is actually optimal. And so that's kind of a leads to a neat question is, well, is if I have an optimal sphere packing, is it necessarily going to have this optimal kissing configuration? And in low dimensions, up to, I, I know up to dimension four it's true, the dimension five, we don't know because we don't know the kissing number, but by the time you get to high enough dimensions, there are packings which um, they're not going to be part of, um, they're not the nice regular lattice packings that we work with. So, all right. yes? My experience with optimization is that if you have a maximization problem like the sphere packing where you want to maximize the density, for example, if there's often a useful dual with the characterization that you can kind of solve one and the other and then there's a bound in between them. Mm -hmm. Is there a dual problem to the sphere packing? I don't know. That's a good question. I know the way they solve it is they don't you, them they solve it by like basically hyperplane cuttings, where basically you take a hyperplane, you know your solution lies down here, so we're going to throw out everything else, and then we're going to look at a smaller problem. But as far as beyond that, I don't know anything about the linear the linear programming problem. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So do you often win contests where you have to guess the number of gumballs? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could like go back and be eight years old again. Because I like I, I love candy. So I remember being a kid and you have those contests and like, oh man, if I could just guess I could get those jelly beans or those gumballs and Yes. Yes. So so now you guys know how, because you know that the, if they're optimally packed, the density is right around three quarters. So if you know the volume of the jar you can figure that out pretty quickly. So, good question. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions for All right, thank you. Adam State College, great stories begin here.